This morning, Tom and I will be offering you scripture in the style of echo reading. And we feel that that style of sharing scripture is in line with how Jesus taught, in particular with Jesus and teaching with parables that the wise went away not knowing what he was talking about. So as you listen to these juxtaposed pieces of scripture, don't try to figure it out with your mind, but instead listen and allow your heart to absorb what we say. And before we begin, I also just want to prepare you for what's going to be a little different in the sermon. It's um, what I call a surgeon sermon project. It kind of has three movements. You'll get it when it happens, just so you know. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Loving God, I pray to you now that the words from my mouth, from Tom's mouth, will be pleasing and acceptable to you. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will take these words and bring them to the people gathered here this morning, that they will, you will bring it through their ears and into their hearts, where you will plant your word for them, a seed that will be planted deeply in their spirits and that will grow each day as they seek to live following you. We pray all this in the name of the risen Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Moses led his flock beyond the wilderness to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. God called to Moses out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then God said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet from the place on which you were standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people. I have heard their cry. So come, I will send you to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go? The Lord said, I will be with you. So Naomi set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters, go your way. And Naomi explained there was nothing for them in her homeland. And they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and turned back. But Ruth clung to Naomi and said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. When she saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, Naomi said no more. So the two of them went out together. Now, 
Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. And as he was walking along, Jesus saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed Jesus. So most, if not all of you, know that I went to Australia for a three-week journey, vacation journey with my husband, Ken, and I brought the bag to prove it. It says, Australia, the gift. And like most tourists, I brought home some souvenirs. Some of them were intentionally bought as a souvenir, right? A souvenir we buy to remember the place. So I, brought, I bought myself this t-shirt to remind me of the day we walked down Hastings Street in Noosa. And you can see I haven't even worn it. I don't have the heart to cut off the Australia tag. And so when I looked at it, it just makes me smile and remember that day with Ken and with our friend Jo as she showed us around the town of Noosa. And the other thing I brought was this book. And it's a book of photographs, beautiful photographs, taken by a professional, much better than anything I could have taken. And this was a souvenir for me to take home and remember what the place looked like. It was breathtakingly beautiful. But there were some other things that came home with me, and they didn't, I didn't buy them as a, um, you know, as a souvenir, so to speak. I bought it because when we were at Manly Beach, in Sydney, I had to buy a hat so that it would shade me from the sun because even on a cloudy day, the sun will burn you. And then I also brought with me this neck pillow because I had to fly on a plane overnight and I thought, oh, this will help me, right? This will help me if I can make it work the way it's supposed to, let's see. Yeah. Anyway, it turned out to be incredibly uncomfortable. But it was meant, it was meant to, um, to help me. And then there was this jar of tea that I bought because I liked the taste of the tea, right? So all these, even though I didn't buy them as a souvenir, have become souvenirs of my journey. Uh-oh. I told you it was really uncomfortable. But they're all souvenirs of my journey, our journey to Australia. And I wonder if even now you can recall a time that you went on a vacation, maybe it was a vacation to a wonderful place, and maybe you picked up a souvenir or two, maybe you went to the gift shop and you love the gift shop, or maybe you're like someone I know who hates gift shops, but will be willing because of his love for me, will go into a gift shop. And some of you might do souvenirs with photographs, right? But whatever it is, you bring back something from that journey that reminds you of the place. It reminds you of how you felt. And that's such a good thing. Because when we go on these journeys, especially vacation journeys, we experience something new. And it has an impact on us, doesn't it? I mean, think about what a vacation is like. For hopefully all of you, vacation changes your mindset. You know, vacation is a time to let go of all the to-do lists, of all of the pressing responsibilities you have. It's an opportunity to relax and to really be with the people you care about and to do the things that bring you joy. And so these things that you bring home, they might remind you of the majestic mountains and the pristine waters of the lake, but they also remind you of the experience and the impact it had on your life. Now, for me and Ken, I think our favorite thing, I'm sorry I'm speaking for you, Ken, but I think our favorite thing was that we had very little planning. We just got to a place and stayed there and then thought, what do we feel like doing today? The fav my favorite thing he said to me was the last night we were in Sydney, and I said, oh, well, should we go home now and pack our suitcases, or should we have you know, dinner first? And, and I went on this kind of talk, and he said, I'm not thinking past the end of this street. And to me, that is the essence of vacation mind. And so I'm lucky to have these things, even things like this. 
this hat, because when I look at the hat, it reminds me, it's a little thing, but it reminds me of the freedom I felt. Those of you who have curly, frizzy hair, who struggle with all the products in the, in the hair dryer, I let it go. It just was flying and curly and frizzy and so what? It didn't matter. It was a great sense of freedom. And then this neck pillow reminds me of this great accomplishment of facing my fear of flying, of flying over the Pacific Ocean for 14 hours, not thinking of the TV show Lost that I had watched. And I was not full of anxiety. In fact, Ken said to me, you did good. So this is a reminder of that great accomplishment of facing a fear and not letting it rule the day and make decisions for me. And then when I look at this um, jar of tea, which is now empty, it reminds me of having tea in Australia and lingering over the time, lingering with, in conversation with Ken when in our day-to-day -day existence we say hi and you know, we seem to be crossing, like what do they say, the you know, ships crossing in the night. And it reminds me of telling stories with our friends Joe and Chris and getting to know them better. And it reminds me of the different people we met and got to know, just acquaintances that passing through. We take many journeys in our lives. Journeying is what human beings do. So in response to God's call, Abraham journeyed to the Holy Land, or to the Promised Land, which became the Holy Land. And in response to the God's promise, Moses led his people out of slavery. And in response to God's love, Ruth stayed with Naomi and journeyed with her back to her homeland. And in response to God's invitation, Levi said yes and followed Jesus. These people, in their decision to take the journey, to take the physical journey, had an impact on their inside of them, in their spirits. Their lives were changed. They were reformed, transformed. And that's what journeys have the potential to do for us. They have the potential to give us new eyes, to see things that are that we might have missed before. And maybe that's why all this biblical moving about and the potential to be transformed is why we in the religious business love to talk about journeys of faith as a way, as a metaphor to express our life with God. And why the church often refers to certain liturgical seasons as a journey. For instance, we just finished our time of Lent, our season of Lent, and that was a time that Rick and I decided to call a journey to Jerusalem. And in that time, we gave an opportunity to people, invited and encouraged you to t be intentional about thinking about your faith and what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and how you might live through that journey and how it might impact you. And in those kinds of journeys of the spirit, sometimes what emerges is what I call, is what I call holy souvenirs. Holy souvenirs. And in a conversation I had with Tom Parker, I decided to invite him to share with you his holy souvenir that came from his Lenten journey. So welcome to Holy Talk. <laughs> this is our little talk show we're going to start. You can tell us if you like it, and we'll do it more often. Maybe get it on the local cable channel. But first of all, I want to say thank you, Tom. First of all, for your willingness to come and share something that's so personal. And, um, and you know how much I loved it. So what I want to start you with is just to let the people know what your holy souvenir is and what inspired you to create it. Well, when we talked about uh, the, and, and the, particularly in the prayer groups, and, and I think one of the things you suggested, maybe you'd like to keep a journal of your, of your Lenten pilgrimage on the way to Jerusalem. So I did, and perhaps I went a bit overboard. I, I, I said, well, I like, I, like the, I, I like the idea of writing out, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And then I spotted this little book on um, Amazon, which is leather-bound. It has a Celtic cross on the cover. It has a nice feel to it and has handmade paper. 
And I said, well, what if I use this as an opportunity to write down some of my very favorite Bible verses, some of the Psalms, some of the scriptures, and some of the liturgy that I like? And so what I did is I began to uh, decide what to put in it, began putting them down, and then I felt compelled to uh, uh, find illustrations on the internet and pasted them in. And it was almost like I was creating a medieval devotional book. So I was almost like a young monk who was um, carefully lining the pieces of sheepskin parchment, except this wasn't parchment, this was just soft handmade paper. But I, I then had to rule it and, and write the things down. And when I did that, I found that something about in the act of copying the words, the words from liturgy, the words from scripture, it really, you had to ponder and think about them as you placed each word uh, pen to paper. It really gave one thought about what one was doing. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, I know that you love history. So I wonder how your passion for history guided this practice that you brought into your Lenten journey. So when I started to put, the, uh, put things in the book, I also um, had to um, decide, well, I want to look, look them up. And uh, the, such things as the, as the prayer... Uh, when two or three are gathered together in his name, uh, he is there with us. So I found it was actually a prayer from about the year 400 in the church when the church was, uh, the headquarters of the church were in Constantinople. Mm -hmm. and, and so other things I learned along the way, I learned that uh, when I wanted to put something in about Martin Luther, I knew that Luther was so important in the Reformation that I didn't realize what an accomplished musician he was, and he also was a very accomplished lutist and singer. Mm -hmm. So uh, it kind of it, it gave me an opportunity to um, delve into history and to and to find these um, out these things that I didn't know that I'd never you, known. You tell me about the Stations of the Cross and what yes. that was about. The Stations of the Cross. I decided to add in the Stations of the Cross, and I found that the Stations of the Cross was started out as literally a, you might say, almost a living souvenir that as early as the third and fourth century, pilgrims had gone to the Holy Land, they had gone, uh, retraced the steps of the way, and when they got back home to Europe, they wanted to recreate their experience. Mm -hmm. So they brought with them, they were inspired to create the the Stations of the Cross in the, in the various churches of Europe mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a living souvenir of their experience in the Holy Land. So we've come to the end of this year's Lenten journey. You have your holy souvenir. And now, what does that mean for you now? How, do you, how are you using this book now? Well, really, it's something that I, you know, is nice that I can keep and, and, look, and look back upon and read some of my favorite passages. The book is not quite finished yet. I intend to complete it. And, uh, and even maybe possibly next year I'll, I'll start another one. I'm not sure. But I really, um, it's been an interesting journey of, of faith because it really has made me think and ponder these things. And that a journey is really, it, sometimes the, the, the journey in of in and of itself is important as the destination. And there is this beautiful poem, Ithaca, and which talks about this, the journey to this exotic place. And the poem says, has a wonderful line, it says, because of the experience, may your journey be long. And so I really hope that that is for all of us, that our faith journey is a long one with wonderful experiences along the way. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Tom. Appreciate your sharing, sharing what you shared with us. So in my conversations with Tom outside of this morning, um, there are a couple of things he mentioned to me that really stuck with me about, now here's a man of faith who's been coming to church his whole life, reading the Bible, saying the prayers, and he said it was a journey of discovery and that he, was, he was, came face to face with mystery. And so he had to sort of, he was reformed in that, or transformed in that way of accepting the mystery and, and, and rejoicing, I guess, in the, in the discovery. But you know, whether we take journeys of the spirit, like Tom just shared, or we take journeys to new places, 
The wonderful thing is the experience, and the experience has the potential to widen our perspective and to stretch our imaginations, to transform us into the people that God has created us to be. And there are many stories of transformation in the Bible, and there's one I want to share with you. It, it, it's a very powerful story, I think. It is a story about two um, followers of Jesus. One of them is named, one of them is not. One of them is named Cleopas. And they are journeying home from Jerusalem on the day that the empty tomb was discovered by the women. Now, I want to tell you that story as if it's me. I am the one who's walking with Cleopas. As we made our way home from Jerusalem, we were trying to make sense out of what had happened. But we couldn't. We continued to talk about all the things that we had seen, but we kept wondering about it. We kept wondering about it. Had it only been a week since we had been with Jesus, we walked into Jerusalem with Jesus. We were with the disciples and all of his followers who had traveled with him all through Galilee. We had traveled with him and had been received in Jerusalem with those palms and people cheering us. They were so thrilled that Jesus was there and we were so happy to be with Jesus. But then in a few days, everything changed. And now Jesus is gone. He's dead. And we have nothing but questions. How did this happen? Why did this happen? And so we continued to walk, Cleopas and I, and talking. And we were so heavy with the grief of the untimely loss of this great man, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, who we assumed was this great prophet who would free his people, all of us. Our lives would change. Everything would change. And now that possibility of what might have been is dead with him. And so we were sick in our hearts and we continued to talk so that we didn't notice when the stranger came on the road with us. We didn't notice until he spoke and said, what are you talking about? And Cleopas was first to answer and he said, oh, we're talking about the things of Jesus of Nazareth. Haven't you heard about this? And so Cleopas told the stranger everything that had happened. And he listened. And then he spoke to us and he spoke to us with great devotion and great passion. We were completely spellbound. We listened to every word he said. And something in his presence drew us closer and closer to him, and we didn't interrupt him at all. We just listened. So as we walked, he talked. He talked until we got to Emmaus, our village, and he continued to walk. We said, wait, stranger, don't keep going. It's dangerous to journey alone in the darkness of night. Come with us. You can stay at our home. And we'll give you something to eat, and you can rest overnight and be on your way. So he agreed, and we brought the stranger back to our home. And we prepared a table before him. And I put out the, the wine and the bread. And Cleopas got the cheese and the olives. And we gathered around the table, and the stranger took the bread. And he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave us each a piece. And when I received the piece of bread, something amazing happened. Something unexpected. In that moment when I held the bread and looked at the stranger, it was as if I saw him for the first time. And I saw Jesus. And I was about to speak his name. And he was gone. And immediately I questioned myself. I must have imagined this. Could I have seen what I just thought I saw? 
But then I thought, you know, as he spoke along the road home, my heart was burning in my chest. But I didn't recognize him, even though there was something about him that made me want to get closer and listen. But it wasn't until he took the bread and shared the bread with us, that broken bread, and that's when he was with us. And he is with us now, through the broken bread, through the cup. And Jesus stands before you and he invites you to the table. He invites you to this table that says, in remembrance of me. I say with the most reverence and respect, the holy souvenirs that remind us of God's presence in Christ. So here at this table, may we come and dine at the feast with Jesus the Christ, the feast that celebrates our new life with God. And may we remember.